Hi everyone, our brains are a complex web of billions of neurons playing host to human consciousness. Is it possible to transfer that consciousness to a computer through a mind upload? Could future technology let us transcend our biological limitations and grasp for digital immortality? Keep watching as we dive into these questions and more. This video has three parts. What is mind uploading, brain scanning, and running mindware? Part one, what is mind uploading? Put simply, the idea is to digitize all the information stored in a human brain and transfer it to a computer where you can simulate it. Of course, there are a lot of moving pieces to get there. So first, why would you want to upload a mind in the first place, such as your own? Well, it's a little less obvious, but running a digitized human is going to be faster and consume less resources than a biological person would. It's a great way of backing up someone's mind, someone's personality, potentially for download into a new cloned body or something at some point in the future. It's also potentially a great way to bootstrap artificial intelligence. Current techniques are trying to train artificial intelligence from first principles, but you could also imagine starting from a human mind and then expanding upon that. And finally, the reason of biggest interest, perhaps, is you could get digital immortality because a digital being doesn't really age, doesn't degrade over time, and could essentially live forever. This might sound very futuristic, but it might make more sense as we get into it in more detail. I want to briefly touch upon the singularity, the technological singularity, which is the point at which AI or digital intelligence becomes the main driver for technological innovation, and the point at which it's very difficult to forecast what will happen because better minds than ours will be leading the charge. Mind uploading is pretty closely tied to this idea of a singularity. Assuming that uploaded humans are able to think faster and therefore innovate more effectively than a biological human, that would imply that achieving mind uploading means that you're probably kickstarting the singularity. And vice versa too, if you have super intelligent AI, it's probably easier for it to figure out how to achieve mind uploading if that is a technology that has not yet been achieved. One unanswered question is, if you transfer from a human body into a digital consciousness, is that really still you? Is this the same person? Would you subjectively experience first being in a human body and then being in a digital body? Or would it be some other person, kind of like a clone that is looking a lot like you? That's the subject of a previous video I made. I'll link it here. That video was the second in a series of three about immortality, and this is the third. So back to mind uploading. How do you actually go about it? Although we haven't invented this technology yet, we vision that there would be two main steps. The first is brain scanning, and the second is running mindware, or first figuring out and digitizing whatever's in a human brain, and then once you have it on a computer, figuring out how to emulate and run that brain as if it were a program and get the desired results. The remaining two parts of this video will cover those two main steps. Part two, brain scanning. The problem is that it's very hard to figure out what's going on inside a brain. Firstly, the brain is an amazingly complex entity. There are about 86 billion neurons in a typical human brain. Those are the individual cells that are extremely long lived. They're formed when you're born basically and last throughout your life. And between all those different neurons are a lot of different connections, which are called synapses. If you come from a machine learning background, neuron cells are like layers in a neural network and the edges in that graph, which might be implicit for an ML model, are equivalent to synapses. Anyway, in a brain, each neuron connects to about 7,000 other neurons on average, but a select few neurons have 200,000 connections to synapses. And the connections aren't just connections, they actually do some manner of computation as well. In the simplified model that machine learning uses, connections are just connections. There's no computation done in them, really. The brain is a biological soup with neurons and synapses like we mentioned, but also lots of hormones and chemicals and tons of interlocking processes from the rest of your body's systems. In the 1990s, we thought the brain had approximately teraflop level computation if you were to try to compare it to a computer, but we now believe that it's actually on the order of exaflops. In other words, a million times larger. And unlike supercomputers, the fastest of which are just starting to hit that exaflop scale threshold, your brain draws about 20 watts of power. <laughs> it's quite likely that some aspect of the calculations that are happening in your brain are actually dependent on quantum properties because otherwise it just doesn't make sense. So the brain is really complicated and trying to migrate it to a completely different computing substrate like classical computers or even quantum computers is extremely complicated because we don't even really understand how the brain works, not well enough to try to do this anyways. So let's talk about current brain scanning techniques. Unfortunately, external radiological imaging like CAT scans or PET scans are not nearly high resolution enough to figure out what's going on in your brain at enough level of detail to try to simulate it. Right now, we have to use electron microscopes. 
and it's terribly gruesome, but the way that you use an electron microscope is to slice something up into very thin slides so that the electrons can actually pass through it. So yeah, if you want to scan a brain right now, you have to slice it up into really thin segments. And it's an absolutely massive task. In 2019, some researchers took a cubic millimeter of mouse brain and tried to scan it. It took five electron microscopes running for five months straight, and they ended up with two petabytes of data, that's about 2,000 terabytes of data, just to store the scan from one cubic millimeter of brain, which had about 100,000 neurons in it. And remember, a human brain has billions. The way we're scanning right now is a bit like taking a paper book and memorizing the location of all the molecules in that book. It's really silly because the information stored in a book is really in the words and you can just read the words and store those and it would take far less data than actually remembering the position of all the molecules. But we don't understand how to read the brain the way we know how to read a book. So we're just storing the position of all the molecules, basically. Speaking of slicing brains into thin slices, not that that's much of a recommendation, you should definitely read the book House of Sons by Alistair Reynolds. Not only does it have one instance of brains getting sliced, it also has a group of people that don't age that have been around for millions of years that are all clones of one original person. Very interesting from a longevity and immortality perspective. If you follow the news of brain scanning technology, you might have heard of Nectome, which is a startup out of Y Combinator, the most respected accelerator out there, that developed a way to keep a body and a brain intact for hundreds if not thousands of years. And the idea here is that you keep the brain intact enough that a future scan would be able to look in and see where all the neurons are and all the synapses and anything else that's going on inside the brain. The strange part is that this is just a preservation technique. Technically speaking, it's a 100% fatal cryo embalming. I don't know why all these words and descriptions about brains sound terrible. You can actually pay this company $10,000 and upon your death, they'll actually take your brain and preserve it basically in the hopes that it could be resurrected in the future or scanned at least. They used their technique on a pig's brain and then afterwards every synapse could still be identified using an electron microscope. So there's some reason to believe that this could work. And interesting tidbit, Sam Altman, the CEO of OpenAI, has actually signed up for this service. Moving on from current approaches, let's talk a bit about what I would call stochastic approaches. A stochastic model is an imperfect model. It uses probabilities or statistics to try to guess at what's going on. Of course, if you add a lot of parameters to a stochastic model, it becomes very, very good because that's basically what a large language model is. But anyway, you could imagine taking a stochastic scan of your brain and then running an emulation of you that would definitely not be conscious and definitely not be the same person, but might be able to very accurately predict your responses and your behaviors. Basically like doing transfer learning from your brain to another model. Again, I don't think this would actually result in consciousness transfer. It wouldn't really be a mind upload in the way that we think about the words. However, you can build a stochastic model at many different levels of granularity. So you could build one today with whatever brain scan you have available. And then as better and better scans are invented, you can refine those models and really measure progress that way. My wackiest idea for how you might achieve brain scanning is through quantum simulation. So we know that the brain is very complicated and may depend on quantum effects as well. So trying to understand it just by measuring the molecules and atoms might not get you that far. So think about what happens with a computer. Because CPUs are very complicated and they constantly evolve over time, if you're trying to take a program and move it to a completely different substrate, like a completely different type of CPU, what you normally do is you just emulate the original architecture. You just say, okay, here was the original system. I'm just gonna put a layer underneath that makes it think that it's still running in the same way and all will be golden. A virtual machine, if you will. So maybe the easiest way to simulate a brain would actually be to simulate the physical reality underpinning the brain at the lowest layer, which is quantum mechanics. For example, you could make an exact copy of a brain by having each particle in the new copy precisely entangled with the old copy. Or if the many worlds hypothesis is correct, you might be able to tap into a different world a little bit, observe a bunch of particles, thereby collapsing their state, but learning a lot about what the brain is doing, or somehow use it as a computation mechanism to run your new brain. So I spent a while reading about this and going down a rabbit hole, I'm sorry, a wormhole of quantum mechanics, but let's definitely talk about that in another video. Part three, running mindware. Mindware is a fancy name for software that emulates minds. And no, I didn't make that up. It appears to be a real term. The thing with mindware is that it's really complicated because it's not just a matter of scale. For example, there's a simple organism, a nematode, which is kind of like a worm called C. elegans, which has only 302 neurons in its entire brain. 
and for 37 years, we've known all the connections between those 300-some neurons. Despite that, we haven't been able to actually create an accurate simulation that behaves the same way that real-world worm behaves. Again, there are probably quantum effects involved that we don't really understand, but we could probably emulate those pretty easily if we knew what they were. So the key is we just really have to learn more about how brains actually work. But we know the general idea. It would be to run your brain's thoughts based on the uploaded brain, basically. This virtual brain would be subject to the same limitations as any other virtual entity, which means, for example, it would have no direct notion of time, it could be suspended indefinitely, and the brain itself couldn't tell. This also holds true for AI, of course. All these hold true for AI. On the plus side, it would not use very many resources because running a computation is pretty cheap. You need electricity and the compute necessary to do it. And this virtual brain would be essentially immortal, especially if backups were made of its data. There's a lot of scary stuff with cloning because you can clone a virtual person many times over. Doing so doesn't require their consent or knowledge. Of course, you can also just read information straight from that person's brain, assuming you knew how the brain worked. So there'd be no secrets, not from the system that's actually running the mindware. And as I mentioned at the beginning, these virtual brains could potentially be used as the basis for artificial intelligence. What better way to make an aligned AI than to start with an already aligned human? That's most of what we know about mindware. We suspect it would just be an emulation, a computer simulation, but if we can't emulate a nematode, then there's obviously still work to be done. Last question you probably have is what are the timelines for all of this? We talked about how brain scanning has a data problem and actually the original cryogenic freezing techniques that were used to preserve bodies from many decades ago probably actually destroy some of the synapses. So cryogenic freezing on its own is not really a good enough solution to preserve someone for future brain scans. If you use embalming techniques like that startup Nectome, then you have a much better chance. Of course, the exponential growth of computing and data storage will make it more and more possible to actually store all the data needed from a brain scan. But in my opinion, we really need to understand the brain better before any of that's gonna be useful. So high bandwidth brain computer interfaces are gonna be really critical because that's the first connection that you can have between a human brain and the electronic world. And the brain computer interface technology is probably itself gonna be a form of brain scan. And if we can get that to high bandwidth so you can transfer a lot of information in a short period of time, then it means we have a really good brain scan. So keep an eye out for high bandwidth BCI devices. And finally, like I said at the beginning, the technological singularity is somewhat closely tied to mind uploading because one might enable the other. And optimistic estimates for the singularity put it at 20 2045. So bizarre as it might seem, I think it's quite possible that people alive today could actually experience mind uploading. Finally, in conclusion, we talked about some of the complexities involved in a human brain, which is basically an exaflop scale supercomputer on par with the fastest supercomputers that we can build today, and yet uses about as much energy as a light bulb, which probably means there are some quantum effects going on that we don't fully understand. We broke down mind uploading into two parts, the brain scan necessary to actually figure out what's in your brain and then the mindware necessary to actually emulate in a computer what was going on in the physical world. If you processed all that, you might be left with one question, which is, wait, what happens when you actually do a mind upload? Is consciousness actually transferred or do you just see a clone of yourself getting created essentially? And that's a great question. And you should check out the previous video I made in this series where we talk about the philosophy of immortality. The short answer is if you do that in a kind of dumb way, then yeah, it's probably just a clone. But the way that that technology will probably arise might actually be a real consciousness transfer. Don't forget to like and subscribe and share this video with a friend that you think would like it. Well, that's all I have for today. Thank you very much for watching. Bye.